In our first story, the Ghana Union of Traders Associations has observed some foreigners are devising new strategies to engage in retail trading in Ghanaian markets. Guta chairman in the Ashanti region, Anthony Opon, says the foreigners are now taking their goods to the doorsteps of patrons, while others mount tabletops to sell. This comes after a government task force closed down shops of foreigners for not complying with the trade laws of the Ghana Investments Promotion Council. Nani Aljima has more in this report. The JIPC law prohibits foreigners from engaging in retail business unless they have an investment of $1 million and employ at least 50 locals. Non-compliance resulted in lockup of shops owned by foreigners, especially those operating in the Swami magazine enclave. Guta chairman in Ashanti region, Anthony Opon explains some affected shops have been opened following compliance to the laws. And since the closure, those people whose documents were, had expired by then had been given the opportunity to regularize themselves. I myself have opened about five shops here in Kumasi of those whose documents had expired by then. All those shops that are still under locks are those who have flattered, they don't, they don't have the state permit, they don't have the working permit, they don't have the GIPC re registration and all the necessary documents. Mr. Opon explains the foreign traders are perpetrating illegality in diverse forms. Guta wants the tax force to commence the second phase of the exercise, which seeks to enforce the regulations in other parts of the city. The exercise was supposed to flush up everybody operating illegally in our system. So we did the first phase because the time, because of time limit, we couldn't time constraints, we couldn't go through all. So we ended up to some place, and we earmarked some other places we were supposed to go, which couldn't happen. So the second phase, to the best of my understanding, is supposed to start from where we left and cover the whole city. There are people operating now. We have some operating on bike, motorbikes. Some are distributing goods with distributing vans going as far as our villages to sell their goods. So as you go to Achen 4 Market, go to Alaba, go to Yachan School, you will see them displaying their goods in front of the lock shops. For Joy News, Nanaya Ojima reporting. Away from that story, residents and mobile money operators in the OT regional capital, Dambai, say the poor services rendered them by telcos in the area is negatively affecting their business and other official communications. Currently, network connectivity in the area could go off for hours or even days. This, the residents say, is affecting productivity. They are calling on service providers in the area to improve upon their services to enhance business transactions. Peter Senu has more. Cuts in mobile phone network connectivity in the OT region is a rampant phenomenon with some of the disruptions lasting at least a week. Residents who spoke to join you say this is affecting their businesses and productivity at work. Here is Francis, a mobile money vendor. The network is very bad here, especially on Mondays. Mondays, uh, this is market day here in Dambai. Mondays, you will be there and nobody will tell you anything before you realize the network is off. And when this happens, there are two things here. You, the vendor, you lose. What I mean here is that Sometimes you would instruct or you issue command, cash out, it will go all right before you realize it will not be deducted from the, 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 the subscriber's phone and then you will be at a loss. The person will go, at the end of the day you go to the house trying to reconcile the figures and all that and then you wouldn't find who exactly to con contact. And when the network is off, you are there. You are just there. You don't know what to do. Don't, don't forget that the money you use to do this business may not be your personal money. So as the network is not available or is, it breaks, you are losing by the day. Every minute of network instability means a lot to the business. Liberty works with the OT Regional Coordinating Council and shares how the network situation is affecting his schedules at work. Yeah, what I do, I, I coordinate all the activities of the HR in the, in the region. 
with my boss. And then most of the times, when we needed information, we need to, you know, call them through phone. And then where my office is located, as if it is not part of, you know, the region, there is no network. There is no network at all. You, you, so you have to look for a vantage point and then place your phone there. And then that is where you can get the network to make that call. I don't know if it is the case that per where the the mass is erected is far away from the regional coordinating council. Then we are pleading with MTN or the other network providers to come closer to us so that we can get access to the network. Because it's really, you know, worrying the, the, the works of the ORCC. Isaac Mensa is another mobile money vendor. Apart from the network challenges, he laments the absence of any major office of any of the service providers at the regional capital to resolve challenges. And I was at the regional capital. This is the regional capital, and what worries me most is that there is no single office for the telcos here. One would have to travel to Ketekrachi or Nkwanta to fix any minor challenge, and we would not spend less than 50 Ghana cities. This is a big challenge to us. Various security heads in the regional capital who would either have to place a call or file a report to a superior officer have complained off camera about the effect of the mobile network instability on the operations in the regional capital. Res now, some 16 excavators believed to be used by illegal miners in the wanton destruction and pollution of river bodies have been seized by the Western Region Security Council. The security team made up of Operation Vanguard, Immigration, National Security, with support from the Amemfi West District Assembly, stormed some illegal mining sites at Samra Boy in the anti galamse operation dubbed Clean Water. Western Regional Minister Kwabna Ochridakomenza, who led the operation, managed to seize 16 excavators being used to mine in the Tano River. There's more in the following report. ...of destruction and degradation were visible from miles away. Abandoned pits and mining settlements dot the road leading into what is left for the once vast arable cocoa farm. After navigating through the dangerous terrain of open pits filled with water, we arrived at the mining settlement directly on the river Tano. The Tano River, which runs through these cocoa farms, has turned muddy with no sign of life. What beats my mind is that this operation they've been doing, illegal operation, is close to the river, the Tano River. Look at how bad turbid it has become. So when this one goes all the way to the south, it becomes difficult to control. So this is not even those who are directly sitting on top of the river, but these are people who are, whose act, actions are just too close to the river. And what beats my mind is that they keep pumping their waste into the river with all the chemicals and the stuff, and I believe that is not the way to go. Tens of polytanks and barrels filled with diesel were found on the site, but illegal miners were nowhere to be found as the tax force believes someone has given them information of their coming. The vast cocoa farm depicts scenes of cocoa trees cut and buried in mud. Some fans have been left in the pits by the illegal miners. So this is not the first and last we are doing. We will also be going to other sites unannounced and we'll be arresting as many people as um, we can get hold of. Um, today we are doing three operations. One in Takwa area, one in uh, Elembele. Elembele, we've been able to arrest four people. We're sending them to Sekendi. And we are sending the excavators also to uh, Asenkegwa and take some of the equipment all the way to Accra. So we want people to understand that we are going to fight this menace to the last to make sure that Ghanaians can live in peace and have water to drink. Um, if you look at what, how bad this um, river has become turbid, it shows that we have to spend more money as a country to correct it. And I believe that that is not the best way to go. Um, we'll be able 
that you get water, good water for our people if you continue this type of action. Um, so we are, we, are, we are working on and we'll be moving on to other places. And we'll be coming back to check and making sure that what we've succeeded in doing today will last so that this business of people <laughs> illegally mining our gold doesn't go on. If these things are happening on the lands of chiefs and they are not reporting, I mean, nobody can tell me that they are not away. They are away. Because if you look around, you can see cocoa farms. Mm. So the cocoa farmers are also selling their cocoa. And naturally, the chief will hear that people are selling their cocoa. And I believe that even cocoa board, they should even give, let them give us indication as to what um, is happening. So we can also chase them up and make sure that we can secure these places for, for the good of the country. And so, on. so I believe that the chiefs should now consider themselves as real partners in the fight against illegal mining. Municipal Chief Executive for Aminfi West, George Ejri, assures they are going to arrest anyone connected to such illegalities. We are requesting uh, outboard motors. You know, the Vatandor is just here, and the airways go straight to the Vatandor. We are requesting outboard motors permanently on the Vatandor to patrol. But these people, though they are not permanently on the Vatandor, but their ways goes to the river tunnel. Whilst we are patrolling, we will see everybody who is along the river body. The western region is most likely to battle acute water shortage if illegal mining continues on its water bodies, as the Ghana Water Company has already confirmed the difficulties they are encountering in providing portable water to residents. For Joy News, in Athalia Kwansa, Samra Boy. The road accidents killed 513 people in the Ashanti region in the first quarter of the year. To reduce the spate of road fatalities, personnel of the Police Motor Traffic and Transport Department are receiving training in, in enforcing regulation on speed limits. The training is, is a collaboration between the police and the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly. Road crashes have been a growing concern in Ghana. With the increasing fatalities on the roads, senior and junior staff of the MTTD have been engaged to be equipped in enforcing speed limits. After the training, the officers hit the streets to put their acquired skills into practice. Superintendent Emmanuel Edubwine is the Shanti Regional MTTD commander. We are recording so many crashes within the city. And the basic objective is to reduce the crashes. When the crashes are reduced automatically, the deaths will reduce. This is a training section. So we are going through the training. After the training, the machine or the device that we are going to be provided, it is not yet provided, but the machine that we are going to be provided is, is designed in such a way that it can capture multiples of vehicles. And we can slot it, it has a chip, inbuilt chip. We can fix it in a, a computer, and then we can show you the, the speed limit at which we were traveling. We can also give you the still uh, pictures. So it is our prayer that just after the training, the machine also comes, and then we begin with the, with the project. Public Relations Officer of KME, Ifia Kunedwa Bwaje, says the training will help reduce excessive speeding in the region. Road safety, as we all know, is a shared responsibility and as city authorities, we thought it wise to do a refresher course and build the capacity of our police service, especially the MTTD. And so KMA in partnership with Bloomberg Initiative for Global Road Safety has embarked on this four days um, training exercise for men in the MTTD to equip them on data-led enforcement, speed enforcement, and then practical hands on deck. So as you saw earlier on, we went to the divine stretch of road, they monitored the speed of the cars coming, and then there were caution and other things that they gave to the people there. So basically we want to reduce the speed within the city, and it's mostly the, the plan was for those in the greater Kumasi enclave. But then the regional director of MTTD thought it wise to invite men from the other districts so that together, we will be able to reduce road crashes and others in the region as a whole. Latifa Walsh reports for Joy News. 
You're live on Joy News today. Now, police investigators are today wrapping up a detailed reconstruction of how a 10-year-old boy was allegedly killed by two teenagers at Kaswalamte. Crime scene experts have spent days taking notes on how the teenagers lured the boy to his death and the subsequent attempt to bury his remains. The alleged crime left many shocked. After it emerged, it was for money ritual purposes. The teenagers are currently facing the charge of murder. Joseph Akable joins us from the scene of the crime with Bo. So Joe, tell us exactly what is happening in terms of this reconstruction by the crime scene experts. And so first, the residence where uh, the boy lives, the boy who is said to have been killed, what has happened is that the front of the residence has been cordoned off with tape that indicates that it's a crime scene. Uh, the specific scene where the murder is said to have taken place is about 50 meters away from the right-hand side of the residence, and that is an uncompleted building, which has also been cordoned off. And the suspects are present here, the two of them. One of them passed his relatives present because the state as a stands is treating him as a minor, and so the relatives are here to grant consent for the process that is taking place. So the suspects are taking the crime scene, as I expect, through the crime scene, starting from where they met the boy, which direction they took the boy through, to the crime scene as well as how it took place. There's a mannequin that the police investigators have here as well. Uh, which what they, they are doing with the mannequin is that they have some red substance that they put on part of the body, the specific areas where the boy was bleeding after he had been hit. And so they've also pointed the specific areas, part of the body that is hit with various items which are also here at the crime scene. And so that is what they are doing here. The crime scene has set up the photographers with them. They are taking pictures and also taking detailed notes of what they are being told and they understand that all this will form part of the body of evidence that we put before the court when the committal proceedings takes place out of an court district court uh, with the state making a request that the two individuals should be committed to stand trial for murder. And so the expectation also is that uh, they conclude this particular process today. Joseph, it sounds like a very grim scene you are describing there. Uh, tell us about this suspect. Um, does he seem remorseful? They are both quite calm as they are being led. In fact, there are a bit of the neighbors here who are present at the scene are not far from the cordon of area. And they are, a lot of them are expressing surprise. In fact, while the suspects were being led uh, very close to them, some of them were shouting uh, words or statements like, I mean, uh, they are now pressure with their to wait. I mean, what exactly do they want to collect? Uh, that for which reason they are doing what they are doing, making the point that they are surprised that these young men were engaged in such a crime and wondering what they want to gain from this particular act, for which reason they decided to embark on such an activity. That is it, and the narrative that will be put out by the police investigators start with. And so their demeanor, they are quite armed, they look remorseful while they are being led, and are uh, taking the police investigators as well to various aspects of uh, the scene of the crime and how uh, this alleged crime is said to have taken place. Now, I heard you say earlier, Joseph, that one of the suspects is being treated as a minor, and that is why his family is present to give consent to the process that the police is taking them through. Does it mean that the ages of the two persons has, uh, have been resolved? We know it was an issue earlier. We understand it has not been resolved yet, uh, but the initial investigation that has, been, has taken place so far points to the fact that one of them may be a minor. So that is how the police is treating it for now. Because of the need to wrap up investigations quickly, they do not want to make any mistakes. And so in the event that it turns out that it should be a minor and they have reached some certain rights in the course of investigation, will mean that all that evidence that is collected will be null and void. They will have to go over that process again. And so they are taking a precaution of treating him as a minor in that encouraging evidence that involves in the need to have his relatives present to grant consent for that particular aspect of the investigation. Sounds. If it turns out that he's not a minor, then nothing is false in the investigations proceed. It sounds like they're being very meticulous, Joseph. Now, we understand some officials of the Catholic Church have paid a visit to the family of the murdered boy to commiserate with them. What have they been saying? Specifically, is the National Women's Wing, and uh, the investigation that they are doing, they are indicating that in terms of the Catholic Women's Wing, they say that they've come here uh, because uh, they are mothers and they are concerned about what has happened to this particular family. So they came to come with them. And they say that this particular incident is a reminder to parents that they need to pay attention to the upbringing of their children and address their needs uh, to ensure that they are not led by persons who convince them that there is more to life 
than uh, sticking to the principles and knowing that the actual aim of life is to uh, live a good and decent life, enjoy your maker eventually, rather than want to gain wealth and to get worldly possessions that will not really uh, take you anywhere eventually. Thank you, Joseph. Still to come in the bulletin, 285 residents displaced by rainstorm at Arhasan Kura, a suburb of Damongo in the West Gonja municipality. We'll be back with more. Thanks for staying with us and about 285 residents have been displaced by a rainstorm at Al Hassan Kura, a suburb of Damongo in the West Gonja municipality. These include 145 children and 90 women in the community in the Savannah region. Our regional correspondent Isaac Nonya has more. Three of the injured are women while 82 households were rendered homeless. Both public and private properties like buildings, mental containers and shops we also hit with some houses' roofs completely ripped off. But at the time journeys visited the community, many households had begun reconstruction, with few still counting their losses. The West Gonja Municipal Director of the National Disaster Management Authority, Adam Darwin, said the impact on the ground is very merciful and needs urgent attention. Alasankura, when we got there the next day after the rainstorm, we realized that two, three houses completely will be ripped off. People that have three rooms, four rooms, it will be ripped off completely. It was just a mess when we got there. The people really need the support of the public, especially NADMO and the government uh, of the day. Because you will see that the people are, will be finding it, are finding it very difficult to be able to put back shelter for themselves. And so I think that if serious help is needed, then the people of Alasankura and Hangalai are the people that they have to come to their aid and help them so that they can also be, be they can, can also bring smiles to the faces of the, the families that were affected at that area. Some victims who were still reconstructed shared their plights with joining us. I said, why did you, did you do something in the course of this? For now, I'm a hardware technician. I have some laptops in the room that I'm still working on, but I have to try and revive them for now. But I've not lost anything. It's only my zincs have lost them some wood because I have to buy wood and some zincs. I should come and check my machine. And when I got here, the whole roof was not there. The whole tint was removed from the machine side to a different side. We we're just fortunate people were not in the compounds they think laid on. Otherwise, it would have been a disaster. Yeah. But actually, the whole roof got opened. Were well, some of the house. machines destroyed or damaged? Uh, for now, we can't tell. But water got inside, so we have to remove the machines. Yeah. You know, there are some wires inside, so we have to remove everything else. So now, there's no light, so we can't tell what happened. So if I mean, not, the, the windstorm was really heavy. Very, very heavy. Very, very heavy. Yeah, we were not even alone. We had some people, some of them, their houses even got down. Yeah, but for us, they are just the roof that got down. We stay in that part of the country because most primary schools in the West Gonja municipality of the Savannah region are forced to study sitting or lying on the ground due to the unavailability of furniture. Checks by Joy News' Savannah region correspondent Isaac Nonya indicated that pupils had to sit in pairs and in fours. Isaac has more. According to the report filed by Eisenhower, two female students were cited sharing a single chair by taking turns and sitting on one another, their teacher also deprived of furniture. These conditions is not different in the lower primary, with majority in class of about 45 students sitting or lying on the floor for the academic work. Students who refused to sit on the bare floor decided to repair the broken chairs and tables while others decided to jog around. Do you have chairs in the classroom? No. So how are you sitting? Why do you have chairs? Some of them are jogging, jogging. Uh -huh. um, some of them, we don't, we don't have chairs to sit. Some of them are sitting there. And we start this one outside. But I saw you trying to nail this one. Yes. Are you able to do it? 
How many are you? How many of you normally sit on the chair? One chair. Oh. They said I saw some sitting on each other's laps. Is it true? So what are you doing now? You are trying to wait for me. You are how many in the class? How many are you in the class? And how many chairs are there? School authorities who interacted with join us revealed that they have not received furniture from the Municipal Education Directory of the Ghana Education Service for the past five years. Where's now, the Ghana Boundary Commission has begun sensitizing residents living in border communities to help protect the pillars and other markings signifying Ghana's territorial sovereignty. Authorities at the commission set up to harmoniously settle matters concerning Ghana's boundaries with its neighbors to avoid an escalation of tensions, say, they are conducting an audit of boundaries throughout the country, starting with land boundaries in the Volta region. National Coordinator of the Commission, Brigadier General Emmanuel Kotia, has been explaining to traditional authorities in the area why they should not confront their neighbors in border towns over these land demarcations. Head of our security desk, Gifty Andoapia, has a wrap. The Ghana Boundary Commission is an organization set up to deal with issues arising from Ghana's boundaries with its neighbors. Although the law governing the organization was passed, operationalization of the commission to deal with boundary issues between Ghana and its neighbors happened at the latter part of last year. Ghana's maritime boundary dispute with Ivory Coast, which started in 2010 and ended up in court, is one of the situations the commission is hoping to avoid by clearing out the blurred lines starting with the land boundaries. Brigadier General Emmanuel Kotia is the national coordinator. We are responsible for ensuring that our land boundaries are secured, the pillars are also well placed and they are not disturbed. And for that matter, we are also responsible for ensuring that our land boundaries are not tempered with and that they border committees within the various district security councils should be very proactive in identifying some of these challenges. For about two days, his men have been on the ground, along with Immigration and National Investigation Bureau officers, gathering data that will guide the Commission's engagement with its Togolese counterparts. Today, they have just finished briefing him and are taking us to review their findings on the ground. This is the gate that separates two countries. With COVID-19, thoroughfare is not allowed for now. This is one of the pillars meant to show when Ghana's territorial sovereignty ends with Togo. It is lying on its side across the stream instead of being rooted in the ground. Brigadier General Kutia and his men suspect this may have been caused by erosion or other natural causes. But they want to look further to determine whether or not it was a deliberate attempt by anyone to tamper with the demarcations. One of his men explains. So, so the exact location of the pillar would have to be determined by the surveyors using their instrument to determine the coordinates. But we pick the current coordinates of where the pillar is lying and then we we'll forward it to them for them to also do the assessment. Then if there's any follow-up survey activities they can come back and then confirm the exact locations. Where we are standing, we are standing in Togolese territory. Okay. Per the demarcations on the original map of 1972. A long walk will bring us to another pillar with an inscription to the left, BT, meaning British Togoland, and another to the right, TF. With an arrow in between showing which country owns which side. This is the point of separation of two countries, and without these pillars, each country may lay claim to the entire area, and that can create chaos. And that one identifies the international boundary line. So it's part of our efforts in, making, in conducting an audit so far as the boundaries of our countries are concerned. But the priority we have set for ourselves now is to make an audit of 
the problem areas before we go into other areas that do not that there are no controversies. That is the reason why we've selected uh, this area as one of the key areas that we have come to do an audit. So, an audit like this cannot be done by Ghana alone. There was representation from security agencies in Togo. We do this in collaboration with the various security agencies who are responsible for security along the borders of the country. The local authorities, you have seen the district chief executive here, the cooperation of them, and then with even our counterparts in Togo. So you have seen the gendarmerie officer who has been sent in to support us so far as this audit is concerned. Yeah, so that is the collaboration that we are doing. And uh, it's important for you to get the understanding that it's supposed to be done amicably so that there will continue to be a peaceful co coexistence between Ghana and Togo, and especially our people living along the international boundary line. From inspecting the pillars, we meet the traditional leaders of this particular area. Seeing the Ghanaian military in full regalia had raised some concerns initially, but soon their mission was understood by these traditional leaders who subsequently pledged their support to clear out the boundary demarcations. The final port of call is Leklebi Kame. Dufia of the area, Togbi Atachi V, says at least six of his chiefs from other areas have decided to be a part of this engagement. They had a list of concerns, including the closure of the borders, because their farmlands, among others, stretch over into Togo. Our land extends to Kuma in the Republic of Togo and also to Agometomebe in the Republic of Togo. We have farmlands, cocoa farms, coffee farms, palm plantations on these lands. But as we have it now, we are being prevented from visiting our farms. And even the community schools, we have pupils or students coming from the villages and townships that I've mentioned, Kametonu in particular, and other villages like Bume, Heme, and all those who know these places will know. We are asking respectfully for this visit to yield one major favor or one major fruit for this community. That is to ensure that our people who are trapped behind the barricade, our people in Kametonu, our citizens in Kametonu, should be given free access, free movement. DCE for the area, James Etonam Flolu, had some answers, including a request for the community to bear with government as it deals with the pandemic. I think once the borders are opened, we are not going to have such issues. Wow! The main border issues are being addressed. I would urge the community to just help us. It is just for a short while. In no time, the border situation will be relaxed. Then we can live our life in peace. We don't want a situation where we relax and then the pandemic would hit us differently. You are aware, for some time now, we've never had cases of COVID in Afaja to South. But recently, like some two months ago, we recorded some few cases. So we need to be on a lookout. But the Boundary Commission had a message for the traditional leaders not to engage in confrontations over boundary demarcations, but to rather refer such cases to the Commission, which it says have open channels of communication with their counterparts in the neighboring countries and can address the matter quickly and amicably. Do join Gifty on the polls at 3 p.m. as she brings you the full version of this report. You're live on Joy News today and it's time for business. Stay with us. We'll be right back. And thanks for staying with us in business. Post-harvest losses in pineapple production remain a major worry to farmers in the Manso area of the Ashanti region. Farmers are wasting 20% of their crops because there's no demand for their produce. Prince Apia traveled to Manso Isiowin 
to assess the situation. On this stone, Aquasian Tony sharpens his cutlass as a regular routine before he starts today's activities on his five-acre pineapple farm. For close to 15 minutes, Akwesi clears the weeds growing on a farm all alone. Jata, as he is popularly called, ventured farming when the government issued a ban on small-scale mining in 2017. I was an illegal miner, but had to divert into farming. I tried cocoa farming, but it didn't work. I decided to grow pineapples, and they survived. I have farmed pineapples for over three years. After unsuccessful cocoa production, he began pineapple cultivation on his family land all by himself. He has invested 4,000 CDs in this year's cultivation, but struggles to get buyers. Pineapple production in Ghana continues to concentrate in the central, eastern, Volta region and the greater Accra regions of Ghana. There are few farmers like Anthony here in the Shanti region who have decided to enter the market and make some impact. But for some time now, this five-acre land of pineapple is struggling to get market. One after the other, this have become of most of the crops on this farm. They are rotting away because of lack of market. 30% of his pineapples are rotting as a result. For over three years, I have cultivated pineapples, but sometimes I don't get people to buy the produce. At least, I invest 4,000 cities in every cycle, but the investment sometimes go waste. And that's business. Move to Nabila is next with sports. Time now to bring you sports on Joy News today. I am Muftar Nabila Abdullah. Since 1982, Ghana has failed to win the African Cup of Nations. Many have got various stories about why the country has not been able to rule the rest of Africa. One of such people is Ibrahim Tanko, who served as assistant coach when the Black Stars participated in the 2019 African Cup of Nations. According to him, indiscipline could be considered as one of the factors, as one of the reasons why Ghana has not won the tournament. You know, uh, this indiscipline we are talking about is about bringing women in hotel. I mean, when we went to tournament, it's not only players who are in, the, in this hotel. You have officials, you have people yeah. in the hotel. So it's not that when you see a woman, it's, she is from a player. So a discipline that I'm talking about is if we are going to training five o'clock and the coach said we should be in the bus 4.45, everyone must be there. When we, are in, when we are in training, what the coach is telling you, I mean, you have to concentrate and all this. Or everything that is happening behind the scene. Also for me, that is not, a, a player can do anything, even if you give him a soldier to guide him. Yeah. If he wants to do things, he will do. <laughs> yeah, but if it's, it depends on you, the player. If you are a serious player, you want to achieve something, all these things, you put it aside. It's just three to one week. And it's not that the coaches cannot control them. A coach has his job. You have security, you have physio, everyone is doing his job. And everyone must play a role to ensure that success is not beyond the reach of 
the Black Stars in subsequent competitions. Now, let's talk about club football. After 69 days, fans will be allowed to return to match centers for Ghana Premier League football. Communications Director of the Ghana Football Association, Harry Asentichum, says that for the COVID-19 protocols to be fully observed, clubs must ensure they start from the gates where fans get into the stadium. Your responsibility is to write to the police unit and request for um, police personnel on March days. Now, the first thing you have to do is to submit a copy of the fixtures for the whole year. So in, in, in our situation, for instance, we have category A matches, we have category B matches, and then category C matches. Um, these things are known to the clubs. I mean, I don't want to believe that a club like Mediema does not know the category A games that they have. They know that when they play Kotoko is a category A game. When they play Hazavok, it's a category A game. When they play Dreams FC, it is not a category A game. So mostly, the police personnel that we normally request for differ. They don't, I mean, you cannot request for 13 police officers for a game between maybe Dreams FC and Ashanti Gold and request for 13 police officers for a game between Ashanti Gold and Ashanti Kotoko because the two differ. They are not the same. The expectation, the pedigree, the euphoria, the, the, the hunger, um, and everything that go into such big games differ from an inter-allies Dreams FC match. So these clubs are aware. Now the FA has never said anywhere that it is the singular responsibility of these clubs. No, because first of all, these clubs do not control the police unit. We make requests to the Ghana Police Service for personnel to be released to come and police our games. And it is a collaborative effort. So the officer who is in charge of safety and security for the club must work hand in hand with the police officers. And we have done it before. Now, how did Kotoko do it when they played against, against um, Inter-Allies? Yes, the argument is that a Kotoko Inter-Allies game is not the same as a Kotoko Ashanti Gold or a Hazovok um, Olympics game. And as a communications director of the Ghana Football Association, Harry is sent to Chum, talking about how it will be important for all clubs to observe the COVID-19 protocols so that fans can be safe when they grace Ghana Premier League centers. That's all time will permit us here for Sports on Joy News. Today, I am Muftar Nabila Abdullah. Let's do some showbiz. And Ikea Pimpolo has regained her freedom, at least temporarily, after she fully satisfied the bail conditions as set out by the Criminal Division of the Accra High Court. Today, she has one last thing to do, that is to return to her own prison and sign out, then return home to be with her seven-year-old son. According to her lawyer, Andrew Vortier, his client has grown slim and pale and has been in very low spirits having spent at least two days in jail after she was convicted by an Accra circuit court. I uh, consider her spirit is still very, very low. She appears very slim, uh, you know, pale. Yeah, but I have seen the, the, the part of the family, you know, seeing the lawyer, you know, at least I believe that by this time her spirit is, is, is getting up. And how has she been responding to the kind of concerns the support people have been giving her since? Overwhelmingly, you know, she's amazing. She was like, wow, so how the good people of Ghana you know, supporting my cause like this? You know, she realized that more people are supporting her than, than those that are not supporting her. So it's like I see those supporters are in the majority here. Yeah. And Voltaire has also been explaining why it took three days to fully execute the bail granted by the court last Tuesday. Well, on the day we served the police uh, with a motion for bail pending appeal, apparently they were already on the way to some where we were arguing out our, our bail at the, at the court. So having uh, secured the, the, the bail, we had to draw the order and have it served on the, the police. Uh, as well as uh, director of prisons, so that was done. So it took, you know, you know this bureaucratic uh, system. It took some time before the order got to them. 
And now everything has been finalized. This morning, she just signed the bill. And as we speak, she has regained her freedom amid tempor temporary. Yeah. Right, so we understand there was some sort of frustration. Was there any frustration? Catch more of that interview in later bulletins. But this is where we wrap up uh, today's Joy News today. Thank you very much for joining us. The entire week will be back on Monday. In the meantime, you can go on myjoyonline.com and catch the latest news. Get more details of that story. Captain Polo regaining freedom after meeting her bail conditions. There are also a couple other stories. Um, abandon Agenda 111 Hospitals to Resource NHIS, Abekan Kroma tells government. State OBS scandals, uh, State Sues and S. Thompson and four others again. And I was the least expected candidate. John Kuma speaks on his deputy ministerial appointments. If you're interested, you can also read how Nana Grada has been re-arrested after being granted bail. Also, um, there's the details of that story we brought to you earlier. Police investigators concluding reconstruction of a crime scene of a 10-year-old boy's ritual murder. Many thanks for joining us. Have a good day.